So for the next two lectures, we're going to be looking at the application of capacitors, more specifically what we would sometimes refer to as power factor correction capacitors. And there's a lot of material here. And what I'm going to focus on more in the first part is more the operational aspects and how we would come up with size given we have a location. The second part, I'm going to get more into the planning of capacitor bank locations where you figure out then where you going to want to put these specifically um, in each circuit and then also what would be the size associated with that. So the way I'm going to break this up is for the part one lecture, I'll have three different video segments. I'm going to talk a little bit about capacitor bank construction first and just review some fundamentals of reactive power factor. Hopefully you've seen some of this before. And then I want to just summarize what are the benefits of capacitor banks. And I'm going to do that through the use of a worked example. For part B, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can use the K factor to estimate the impact on voltage um, for putting capacitors in the circuit. And then talk about the issue we run into with practical systems where the load varies. And so one fixed size of capacitor is not going to be valid for, say, like a daily operation anymore or seasonal operation anymore. We have to have a way of somehow adjusting that capacitance. So I'm going to be talking about that. And then the third video segment, then I'll go through some examples. So if you've done work with electronics before, you've probably seen capacitors already. And probably what you've seen are these small little capacitors, which would be the capacitors you would put like on a print circuit board. Or if you have an undergraduate lab, these are the sort of capacitors that you can see. The way we would construct these capacitors is basically a capacitor is just um, two pieces of, of um, metallic material of conductor that are separated by an insulator and it could be air but for these uh, smaller units what we would use is we would use some type of dielectric material between the the two conductive plates and one way we would construct this if we want to really pack a lot of capacitance in a small volume would be as shown here where we would actually put this in like in a roll configuration where you'd have the two plates or the two pieces of metal foil that are separated by a um, piece of polyethylene usually, some type of dielectric material. And the energy that would be stored here would be given by one half CV squared. And so um, we're not gonna be able to store a lot of energy in a lot of these smaller capacitors um, but when we talk about the utility applications, we scale all this up. And so instead of trying to get everything to fit into like a small little um, container, little round container, cylindrical container, we tend to make our utility type of power factor correction capacitors a lot larger by enclosing them in these larger metal boxes, if you want to think about it that way. And then what you would have here is you'd have the insulators which would be appropriate with the voltage level that you're working with. So the reason we're talking about capacitors is they could be a very effective tool for improving voltage. And as far as um, things we would want to be doing on a circuit, increasing level of expense, the cheapest thing we could do is balance the circuit. So in your project, you'll be doing that for part two as you'll be balancing the load, reducing the neutral and earth return current, which will in turn make the circuit more efficient in terms of voltage drop. The other thing you could do is you can use capacitor placement. And capacitor placement is used to compensate for the reactive load that you have in your circuit, mostly due to motors. And so instead of drawing that extra amount of reactive current and having that come all the way through from the substation, we would have supply that reactive current locally through the use of a capacitor. If you can't get things in line with either the, re the rebalancing or the capacitor placement, then you look at things like the placement of the voltage regulators, which we talked about in the previous week, 
if that still doesn't fix everything, then you just have to put in larger conductors or instead of having single phase have two phase or instead of having two phase have three phase, which gets very, very expensive. And so after you try all these different options and you know, then the fifth option we would have here is you'd use some sort of integrated bulb bar control where we would basically coordinate the action of all the capacitor banks and all the line regulators on a circuit um, the reason this would be probably the most expensive is if you just had one circuit that had this on, you'd have a lot of overhead in terms of getting your computer system set up in order to implement this, especially with the communications. But if you're going to implement this over a utility-wide system, this, this may not be so bad as far as investment per circuit. And so all these different things, one through four, we'll be looking at in project part two. So what are the benefits I'm going to tell you these benefits now, and then we're going to see that in terms of a worked example, more specifically, you know, how these benefits come about. And there's there's five basic benefits associated with placing capacitors on a circuit. And this is pretty important because if you're looking at making an investment, you're kind of usually looking at these five different benefits, regardless of whether you're doing capacitor replacement or doing some other improvement on a circuit. So let's just kind of go through these and we'll see in the example what these would more specifically look like. So the first benefit of putting capacitors on a distribution circuit would be we're improving the substation power factor. And what I mean by this is we're going to be um, minimizing, we're going to be minimizing our bar flow. All right. So the reason this is so important is that if we have load that consumes reactive power, that reactive power has to come from somewhere, right? And so where, where is it going to come from? Well, it's going to have to come from generation or some capacitor somewhere out in transmission system. Um, and that what that does is that kind of limits the amount of real power these generators could actually produce if they're having to produce reactive power as well. And so we typically don't like to transmit VARs, reactive power, over a long distance. Um, VARs do not travel well because when you're pushing VARs to a system, it's going to cause all these changes in voltage, which are kind of hard to deal with. And so we typically don't like transmitting VARs over long transmission lines. So this is going to be one benefit. We want to basically keep our VAR flow from transmission to distribution as close to zero as we can. The other thing that we've been kind of getting in more into is controlling our voltage, specifically trying to keep the voltage from becoming too low. And so it turns out by injecting bars, we can actually boost voltage. And so if we have a heavy loading condition that pulls the voltage down, bar injection actually is going to boost it back up. We also see loss reduction. So if we can provide VARs locally, we don't have to transmit reactive power over our lines and cables and transformers. And this keeps the current magnitude down, which reduces I squared R losses. And then we're gonna have another item called peak KVA capacity release, where if I can provide my VARs locally and reduce my current magnitude, then this basically um, releases capacity on all my upstream devices that's having to carry that current because if I can drop that current magnitude, then I could put maybe some additional load on the circuit without having to pay for expensive equipment upgrades. And then finally, there's going to be peak KW capacity release where if I can reduce my losses, let's say, then that's going to reduce the net amount of kilowatts or megawatts that's required to power my net load. And that means I can get by with having less generation capacity for feeding load. And especially when you talk about very peak conditions, we have to have very expensive generation that's used to supply that. And so the extent that I can reduce my peak KW demand um, has a huge impact on system economics. And so anyway, these are the five things. And you should actually try to memorize these because this is what you see all over and over again when you talk about distribution planning are these five different types of benefits from the distribution perspective. Okay, so um, anyway, this is just a, the 
a little blank space that I just set up here just to kind of reiterate what I've been talking about here. Again, you've got your transmission system. And I've got this generation that's feeding into it. So I have all these synchronous generators or photovoltaic systems, whatever, feeding into this grid. And then I'm going to have, I'm going to tap into my transmission and I'm going to set up a distribution circuit. And then on this distribution circuit, I'm going to have all these loads out here. And what has to happen, obviously, is I'm going to have to have power flowing from these various generators to this substation to be distributed to all these different sort of loads. And again, I don't want to push a lot of VARs through transmission. That's not going to be very efficient. So again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out how I can supply these VARs locally. And I could put these out on the feeder. I could actually put this like directly into the substation at, at the substation bus. Uh, that would be another location. However, if I put these out in the feeder, I get a lot of other benefits as far as voltage improvement that I could not necessarily get by putting those bars in the substation. So there's pros and cons for either, which we'll talk about a little bit. So how do we construct one of these capacitors? Like I said before, what we're doing is you can think about taking sheets of like foil, right? And you have two sheets of foil for both sides of the plate. Um, you put some sort of an insulator between them and you basically have a capacitor and what we do is we wrap this around um, kind of in, in um, some type of cylindrical or more like a rectangular sort of a form and then we put all these into this this metal can all right actually we don't build like one big physical capacitor. Actually, we build a lot of small ones and we use various parallel series combinations of those. You'll see just a little bit. What you'll also see in these cans are discharge resistors. And this resistance really isn't that much. Um, but the reason we have to have that in there is if I disconnect that capacitor that's been charged up, I don't want that, that trap charge to stand there a long time because it's a safety hazard. And so what I would have to have is once that capacitor gets de-energized, that charge needs to bleed off down to 50 volts in, in five minutes. Uh, otherwise, if somebody were going to touch that right after that's de-energized, they could get electrocuted. And 50 volts is what's kind of viewed as a safe standard that you can touch 50 volts and you won't get as, so much current going through your heart um, that you know, your heart will actually start feeding irregularly. So anyway, this is how these capacitors are, are constructed. And then if you look inside, again, you have these little miniature capacitances, which are kind of made out of this metallic foil. And you put these in different series and parallel combinations. And one reason you would do this is if you'd have a failure, say like an insulation failure somewhere, it doesn't take out the whole capacitor. It doesn't take out the whole can it just causes you to lose a little bit of VAR support. Uh, and so anyway, um, this is how these capacitors actually get constructed. These capacitors all come in um, kind of standardized sizes. And the, the sizes we're using are pretty much in this range here if we're talking about primary distribution. You can see for the lower primary voltages that they would be in increments of, they'd be like 50, 100, 150, 200, 300, whatever, there, there tend to be integer values. And then if you go up to the very high value, more higher values of primary voltage, they just go as low as 100 K bar. And so typically utilities will standardize in certain sizes of these cans, um, just, just do the economics of keeping things in a warehouse. One thing that's interesting about the ratings of these devices is if you have a capacitor that's rated at um, 100K bar, let's say, it could actually operate at higher values. Um, the reason you want this to operate at higher values is basically the amount of Q you're going to get is going to be related to voltage. It's going to be voltage squared divided by the reactants. And so if you have voltage deviation, say the voltage goes up to 10% higher 
than normal, then you don't want that capacitor to burn out. And so typically these have some margin in the ratings. Um, they're designed, you know, they can operate up to 110% of rated voltage. The other thing that's interesting too, when you look at the current levels, is they're set up where they can operate at higher than um, the nominal current you would expect to see. And the other reason why we have these overrated is that current in utility distribution circuits doesn't just contain 60 Hertz. That's what we've been talking about so far, but we're gonna have loads out there that are gonna generate what's called harmonics. There's gonna be a third, a fifth, a seventh, you know, harmonic. What I mean by third, fifth, and sevens is you, you take the order of the harmonic and multiply by the fundamental. So you'll have like 180 Hertz, you'll have 300 Hertz, you'll have 420 Hertz. You'll actually have some of these harmonics in the current, and we'll talk about that in a later lecture. But what this means is because you have these harmonics, these harmonics are gonna add to the RMS current as well as the RMS voltage. And so if you have capacitors in your industrial loads that you would need this additional headroom on the ratings, otherwise these capacitors could be damaged by the harmonic currents associate with certain types of industrial and commercial loads. So we can go back and forth between Q and capacitance. For utility capacitors, we, we typically don't talk about these in terms of a capacitance and microfarads. We usually talk about them in terms of the amount of reactive power they generate at their nominal rate of voltage. And so if, if Q is the voltage square divided by the capacitive reactance and the capacitive reactance is one over omega C, then what you can do is you can actually relate C to Q if you want to. And you can see that this is gonna be a value that's gonna be in terms of microfarads generally. Um, and, and so anyway, we, we typically are gonna talk about capacitors in terms of the reactive power that would be generated at their at their rate of nominal voltage. These capacitors, as I mentioned before, are put into a can type of a format, metallic can format. And if we're gonna mount a fixed capacitor bank, then what we would do is we would put these into a rack, some type of metallic rack. Um, and then you would have a phase A, a phase B, and a phase C capacitor. And depending on, you know, whether you have a delta or non-grounded system or grounded system, you can connect these up in wide ground or you can connect these up in delta. Note that what you would also do for each of the phases is you'd have a fuse link. Uh, something else you'll also see on here as well, which is kind of hard to see, but you'll also have uh, surge arresters to protect these against high voltage. And so if for some reason there's enough of a short in the capacitor bank, then the fuse link would blow. Um, so anyway, um, these aren't that expensive. Probably this price has increased a bit, but it used to be that the parts for this would be about $2,000 for a fixed bank. Not, not extremely expensive at all. Probably more cost is, is the labor of getting this out into the field. We also have switch banks, and the reason we have switch banks is load's not constant. So as load goes up and down, we could switch capacitor banks in and out. And so in, in this case, when we have these bank sizes, we typically have standard values. Maybe it goes from 300 three phase to 2400 K bar three phase. When we have a switch, we used to use oil, but, but now the switches used nowadays, they're typically gonna be vacuum bottles. Um, basically, you're gonna have your, a, a vacuum in, in a bottle, then you have your contacts inside this vacuum bottle, and then are, they, move, uh, they open and close to the use of magnetic actuator. You would also have to have control power, and that's the case to power the actuators. And so that's normally gonna be off 120 volts. They actually have to put a, a little transformer out there to provide it with 120 volts. And then these would be like in the $8,000 region for the parts because the switches are gonna be more expensive and then you also need a controller. So you need about a thousand dollar electronic controller to go with this. So the last thing I wanted to mention 
that these capacitors would also have communications typically. And so we'd have a little control box and this would uh, provide a communications link to utility SCADA system so they could monitor what's going on in the field and turn these switches on and off remotely. You can also have local control on here as we'll talk about in a little bit where this will actually turn the capacitors off depending on the voltage or the reactive current flowing in the line, whatever you want to use for your control points. We can put these capacitors, at, if we're a distribution planner, either out in the feeder or we can put these at the substation. If we put these out in the feeder, we get more benefits as far as loss reduction or improving the feeder voltage. Uh, the problem we run into with putting these out in the feeder is the ability to control. We have to have communications to a device that's out in the middle of nowhere. We could also put these in the substation and this would give you more convenience as far as linking this into substation automation, but then we don't get the benefits and line losses. So if all we need is basically to minimize bars coming from transmission, nothing else, then substation might be the best bet. And you'll see utilities actually using a combination of both. You know, they'll put some of the capacitance out in the feeder and they'll put some of the capacitors in the, in the substation itself. So anyway, let's review some, some definitions for reactive power in case you're a little bit rusty on this. And, and we have a situation where I have a motor and this motor is operating at 35 kilowatts. And so I've got a meter on here and this meter measures 35 kilowatts and it measures a current of 60 amps. And let's assume I've got a voltage, a line voltage of 480 volts. And so, if I have these values for the current and the power, I suppose I've got some sort of a handheld meter that's measuring all this. If I got 35 watts, then if I take my voltage times the current multiplied by the square root of three, this gives me the volt ampere consumption. In this case, is 49.8. Um, a typical rule of thumb, if you have a horsepower rating for your motor, is it typically under rated conditions, um, one horsepower corresponds to a thousand volt amperes. Not exactly all the time, but if you didn't know any, had, had no other information, this would be a good assumption to make. And so you see this kind of matches up with what I've got here. Um, you could also get the power factor by taking the ratio of real to real, um, apparent power. So in this case, it's 0.7 lagging. And typically these devices operate extreme lagging power factors. So you'll see a table in a little bit what these typical ranges would be. So motors consume a lot of reactive power. And if we want to get the Q, one way we can do this is we can take the square root of S squared minus P squared. And so you see the reactive power is 35.4 K bar. So as far as what types of loads consume reactive power, typically um, lights operate pr pretty high power factor. Electronics would be operating at high power factors. But if you have like any type of motor load or if you have something like an arc furnace um, where you're kind of heating up scrap material, then the power factors for these devices are gonna be kind of low. And so if we're talking about the very common sort of motor, which gets used in industry, which is a squirrel cage motor, um, you know, this can range from 0.75 to 0.92 power factor. And these would all be lagging. If you have small little motors in your refrigerator or in your um, air conditioning system, whatever, these would have kind of lower power factors as well. But one thing I want to point out here is, since I'm talking about this, is as we move more to having power electronics in our load devices, instead of having these direct line connected motors, which I'm referring to here, there's nothing in between uh, the secondary and the motor. If we have power electronics drives in there, then those power electronic drives tend to operate closer to the unity power factor. They tend to be look more like constant, um, more P types of loads. And so 
in, in this case, you know, as more and more power electronics gets introduced, our power factors are actually going up. And if you're going to look at data from utility feeders, you know, from 30 years ago up to the present, you know, you probably see these power factors are, are going up each year because loads are becoming more and more power electronics oriented, which are closer to unity power factor. So anyway, um, just keep in mind, you know, that it's more motor load direct line connected motor load that's consuming this reactive power. As far as modeling, then what we need to be thinking about if, if we're looking at the impact capacitor is, is we got to think about oh, uh, what are equivalent models for, for the utility, for the rest of the utility system. And we can typically think of models as, as consisting of resistance, inductance, and capacitance. And up to this point, we mostly been focused on resistance and inductance in series. And so if you have um, load, um, basically load could have a resistant aspect to it, could be like a heating element. Uh, we're gonna see resistance showing up in, in the series impedance of lines. And what we associate it with resistive elements is we would associate losses with that as well, right? And so if I had a, like a um, resistance in a line, if I'm running current through it, then we can get some I squared R heating losses associated with that. For inductors, uh, inductors don't consume any power on average. And so what inductors do consume though, is they do consume reactive power. So we need current going through them to kind of magnetize the inductance. And then if you take the product of the voltage and the current magnitude, to an RMS, then what that's gonna give you, that's gonna give you what we call VARs. And so motors obviously have inductance, transformers have inductance, you have like the leakage or the, the, X, the uh, magnetizing reactance of the core. Uh, lines, and we talked about how lines have a series reactance or series inductance, and so lines would have magnetic fields. All these different types of elements have inductance. And so if all we had was a system of resistances and inductances, then we would have to have some type of a lagging power factor. We would have to have some, a source that's providing reactive power for all these different inductors in the circuit. Now, if we start to introduce capacitance, then again, the average power consumed by a capacitor is zero, just like an inductor. But this time, if you take the product of the voltage times the current and you uh, and you multiply that by minus one, then you actually get the bars that are consumed by a capacitor. And you can see that there's a cancellation possibility here. If the inductor is consuming positive V times I bars and the capacitor is consuming negative V, I bar, v I times I bars, you know, we could possibly get a cancellation effect, which we're gonna get into in just a little bit. And where we see capacitance, well, we've seen that with underground cable, uh, but now we're going to see this more so with actually in purpose putting a capacitor bank out there to purposely get capacitance into, this, into the system. So th these are some of the integral relationships to just show phase shift again, instead of talking about this in terms of reactive power, I can just talk about in terms of the phase of the current. And what you see, given that the inductor current is related to the voltage by an integral, that the capacitor current is related to the voltage by a derivative, is you're going to see a nine degree relationship for assigning total forcing functions between the voltage and current for these two different types of elements. So an inductor, if we have inductive current, the current's going to lag the voltage by 90 degrees. And then if we have a capacitor, the capacitor current's going to lead the voltage by 90 degrees. And we have the possibility now that we could actually make these two currents cancel out, uh, which is what capacitor applications are all about. So anyway, let's take a look at an example of capacitive compensation. And we'll start by looking at a circuit without any capacitance in it. So I've got a source voltage, I've got a series line resistance, and I've got a load. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my um, load right here, which is 3000 kVA with a 0.85 power factor. And I'm going to break that into a load resistance and a load inductance. All right. So the, the real part of this is going to be modeled by the resistance and the reactive part of this is going to be modeled by inductance in this case. This current that goes through the load resistance, a lot of times we refer to that as ID, and the current that's going through the load inductance is gonna be referred to as IQ. And so the, the net current flowing through here is gonna be ID plus J times IQ, all right? This is direct and quadrature current. And if I were gonna solve this circuit, in my case, I did this writing a power flow in a spreadsheet, um, you can run this in a program like Windmill. If, if it's a 12.47 kV circuit, and if I've got this line impedance per model, mile, and I got three miles, then if I were going to solve this circuit, and again, I'm solving a power flow, what I'm going to see at the, the load end, and these are this is a line value voltage, would be 12.01 volts. This is going to correspond to a 3.7% voltage drop where I'm gonna get a line loss of 56.2 kilowatts. This is I squared R in the line. Actually, it's gonna be three I squared R because if, if this were three phase, right? And so it's gonna be three I squared times R. I'm gonna have a um, amount of KVA, which gets supplied by the source. And I'm gonna have a source K bar as well. And so, Basically, I have to have enough substation, excuse me, a substation capacity and cable capacity to supply this um, 3,115 kVA um, at the source end. And then I got to have reactive power coming from my source, my transmission, and my generation in order to provide for this load. And so most of the reactive power is consumed by the load inductance, but some of that reactive power would be consumed by the line inductance, all right? So just keep these numbers in mind that we get a 3.7% drop and the circuit's operating at an efficiency of 97.8% and 2.2% of that power is just being lost due to heat, all right? But anyway, these are my initial performance metrics for this particular circuit. If I were gonna look at the phase relationships, then if this red line is voltage, then I got my current ID and I could also graph out my current IQ. And note, since this is an inductive load that the reactive part's gonna lead the real part by, I'm sorry, it's, the reactive part's gonna lag the real part by nine degrees. And so anyway, this is just what it would look like in the, in the time domain if I hooked up on a, a soul scope. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the capacitor bank in. And that capacitor bank is going to be 1500 K bar. So what's going to be the impact of adding that capacitor bank into the circuit? Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to get now voltage at the low to 12.27 KB. And again, this is a a line value. So you can see what happened was adding that capacitor in there, if I compared to what I had before with no capacitor, it basically increases the voltage. So the percent voltage drop actually goes down. Line losses are now 38.9 kW. So I actually saw them drop down from the base case. If I look at the source KVA, it goes from 30. 115 to 2,593. So I can get by with a smaller transformer size at the substation if there's a transformer up here. And then the source K bar, the amount of bars that the circuit needs to get from the generation transmission system goes from 1,641 to 82, right? So it's almost, it's almost zeroed out, right? I almost, almost got like a perfect compensation here. So anyway, these are, these are the things you ought to be noting when you're looking at circuits and you're adding capacitors is to what degree this improves your situation. So 
if I then add the impact of the capacitor, which is this lighter blue line, then basically what we see is the inductive reactive power is 100 degrees out of phase with the capacitor current. And if I can get those two current magnitudes to match, then I get perfect compensation. I get um, this, this unity power factor um, at, at the load. And so it's kind of hard to get this to match up exactly in real life because you'll see later on these capacitors are fixed sizes. They're not variable. Um, but to the degree we can, you know, we, we kind of like to get this compensation set up to minimize the, the flow of reactive power through our substations. So anyway, as we kind of saw from these results, we get all these different benefits. And these are in a slightly different order that I had at kind of the beginning of this lecture. Since we're kind of focused on voltage now, you definitely see this improves your voltage profile. We get less voltage drop. It's reducing the amount of bars that get pulled from the grid uh, through the substation transformer. And so there's going to be a, a dollar value associated with this. Um, if, if we can kind of reduce the bars being generated um, by our generation have, and transported by transmission, there'll be a dollar benefit to that. We're reducing the line resistive losses. This is I squared R. And if you somehow compute this over time, you can actually get kilowatt hours saved as well. So there's less fuel required to operate the system. There'll be a capacity release that's associated with reducing the KVA requirements. And so if you had a system with a really poor power factor and you wanted to add more load, but your, your substation transform wasn't large enough, one way you can do this is by doing power factor correction. Then by cutting down on the volt amperes, it means you could add some additional load without increasing the size of the substation transformer. And so there's definitely a dollar value associated with this. Most utilities will have a dollar value with capacity release. And then you reduce the power demand, the peak power demand on your generation. And there's going to be typically a dollar per kW peak value associated with this as well. And utilities would have different numbers depending on their scenarios. The benefit of capacitors is so high that typically utilities will go out and do field inspections before their peaks occur. And so if their peaks in the summer, or their peaks in the winter, they'll go out to the field before they hit their peak conditions and they'll make sure all their capacitor banks are working right. Because a lot of times the capacitor banks, the fuses may blow because of harmonics or something like that. And so they typically make sure they have all these capacitor banks in correct operational form before they hit their peak conditions. Now, one thing you have to watch out for is adding even more capacitance does not improve things um, with maybe the exception of voltage. And so if you add too much capacitance into the circuit, that's what's referred to as overcompensation. And a little bit's okay, but a lot of it's bad. So let's suppose I, decided to put a 3000 kVar capacitor in there instead of the 1500, what would be the impact? Um, well, what's gonna happen is in the overcompensation case, I get these indices. And so the original case was 1201, well, now the voltage is boosted up to 12.52. It's actually over nominal, which might be okay. It might be okay. So to some degree, if you're all you're interested in is controlling voltage, then you might want to go with a little bit of overcompensation. But, but that's actually not good for your other indices. Because then if you were to look at your line losses, well, in the original circuit, we were 56.2. We had gotten it down to 38.9 with the, the 1500 kVar capacitor. Now by overcompensating, this jumps up. So we actually shoot past the, the minimum condition and we actually start to increase losses again. You'll also see too that when we overcompensate, we're actually pushing bars back into the system. Uh, and what happens is that our source KVA goes up 
we have to have again that larger transformer now because we're pushing bars back into the grid. And then um, what we're actually going to see is we actually see we have this negative Q flow now. So where is that going to go? What this is going to mean if you have a lot of overcompensated distribution feeders, it means that your synchronous generators in your system at your generator locations would actually have to adjust their reactive compensation where they're actually maybe consuming bars, which isn't really a good operating strategy for a large synchronous generator. And so this is something we would definitely want to avoid. Uh, it's probably even worse than consuming bars would be to push too many bars back into the grid and um, mess up the flow that way. Okay, so this is overcompensation. If it's just a hair over unity is, is okay, but if it goes way overcompensated, then you know that's not a good way to operate either. So you got to make sure you get a match somehow. You got to make sure that you're pushing that bar flow through the substation. You're you're getting that as close to zero as 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 you possibly can. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and then when we get to the second video segment, then we'll get into using the K factor to kind of estimate. Um, what our voltage change is going to be.